We have another episode of Entertas IG Tech Talks presented by Technology Worldwide. Tonight we got a full cast of characters. We have you know me, Brandon from TSCIT. We got Ray from Libertas Consulting. We got Marco from Enterprise DC. And Mr. Bortz, Mason Bortz from BIT. How are we doing tonight, guys? Hey, hey. I'm here. <laughs> I mean, don't say I'm so excited, Mason. When was the last time we saw you on a podcast with us? And you're 2018. It like, hey. <laughs> it, it, it's been four years. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's been four years, but who, who's counting? Right? Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, God. How you, got, how you been, Mason? What's going on? Doing good. We're, uh, we're busy, very busy. And it's, uh, busy is a great problem to have, but uh, busy brings a whole another set of problems. You know, when you're slow... You're uh, you're trying to get as much work as you can, and when you're busy, you're trying to find enough hands to get all the work done. And it'd be really nice if you know you could find a nice in between, <laughs> which I think every business is attempting to to get to that point. Um, but yeah, it's it's been good. Been learning a lot, um, trying out a whole new things. Always pushing myself and and the people that work for me. So uh, we're doing some really cool projects and always expanding. It's uh, expanding as to what we're doing so it's exciting it's great to hear it's great to hear man so uh brandon what are we talking about this evening well i thought we'd uh kick it off with a little check-in see what we've been up to so a few little community related items that we have going on uh we're doing an awesome collaboration with uh the guys over at door jam so we're going to be doing custom tk uh door jams in five different colors uh, proceeds from the sales are going to go towards the charity project that uh, is rapidly approaching on us. And uh, speaking of the charity project, I heard you guys did a little work over the weekend. Or sorry, not over the weekend, over uh, last week. Yeah, last week, uh, good old Rando Rob came down from <laughs> the great nation above Canada and came down and did a wireless site survey of uh, Baraka Church, which was in Sheltonham, Pennsylvania. And Marco came and did a walk through the property with me too, so we can kind of start to design that initial wire path of how we're going to run the property. Um, the building itself is two stories, and I had originally guesstimated that we needed about 23 wireless access points because the entire lower floor, it, it, I call it a concrete jungle. It's concrete floor to ceiling. Um, what do you think about that place, Marco? Well, it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> you say fun, but I feel like you mean the other thing. So I'm trying to, trying to keep it. PG thirteen here. <laughs> okay. It's, yeah, no. It's um, gonna be. It, I mean, we're gonna. We'll put it this way. We're gonna need all hands on deck for it for sure. So you guys heard that? All hands on deck, right? So all people in the uh, technology community, we're going to need you for this one. So please help, help. Yes, please. I would like to expand out my wiring team <laughs> this year, and uh, yeah, have a little bit more than Ray and uh, or sorry, Dave and Rob working with me because got a little overwhelming at times we had a lot yeah and then it, it can be a lot and the last project we did had a lot of everything things everything had a lot of a lot everything of yeah it had a lot of things and then uh, so. i was also trying to decipher the blueprints that uh, marco was generous enough to print out for us and might have missed one or two things so got to work on that this year I yeah mean, did i mean in the, like 20 minutes so no the blueprint the blueprints <laughs> the blueprint were on was great point. i just missed the blueprint it completely. was great yeah, there was a couple wires at the end. They were like, and some of them weren't even close to the data closet. It's like, hey, we forgot to run that wire. Can you guys go pull another one? It's like, sure. Let's just go pull the ceiling apart again. Um, but yeah, uh, what else are we talking about tonight, Brandon? I feel so, like I have my topic list here, but I've I've, I've lost it already. I, I heard that. there's something hiding behind you. Oh yes, the poet wall. We call it the poet wall. So Poet was generous enough to send us uh, their AP, a switch, their glass on-off switch, uh, their light and their motion sensor, and their high-powered AP. Uh, and we've done some testing on it, and I sent all of the information to Poet. And uh, looking forward to getting you guys the report soon. I'm just waiting on some feedback from Poet on some of the things to be found. But uh, all it's exciting stuff. Awesome. I can't wait to hear more about it. So I think that's everything that we wanted to check in on. Was there any other things we needed to check on check in on tonight oh that's right we have a new domain name tkcommunity.org and right now okay. we have a link tree set up on it so if you go there that's going to have links to all of our different items that we have instagram how to connect to our slack the door jam stuff 
LinkedIn, all the fun activities for us. That's just kind of a landing page for now until we get a website working, which uh, should be happening in the near future here. We do have a new community member that's going to be helping us out with that. So look forward to the website here in the near future. And and that's tkcommunity.org with a stress on the org because we yes. are an official nonprofit right now, which is like the biggest piece of news that we've got all week, right? Yes, yes, that is huge. So that was our big thing that we promised the community 10 months ago when we started this was we were going to be a true nonprofit. Any money that goes into this community, we want people to know where it's going, what it's being used for, and know that it's being used for charity or helping this community grow and helping this community run. It's not trying to line any of these four founders' pockets. This is for the community. This is built for the community. Any money put into this community is for the community also. And that was about our promise for the past 10 months. Has it really been 10 months? It has been. It's uh, maybe maybe nine months. I don't know. It's been it's been a whirlwind. Um, and we recently hit over 1,000 followers on Instagram, which was a huge milestone for us. So I'm very proud of us for uh, making that milestone. And, yeah, big things to come. So 1,000 is that, that ultimate step towards 10,000, which goes to 20,000. And when do we, we become technical influencers? Like, I mean, nobody's ever going to want to look at me and buy anything from me. So I'm just just wondering like when do we become that that yeah i think it's ten thousands when you're like a micro influencer yeah um yeah i want to say it's about that so got a little ways to go but and, we're we're moving forward and i think yeah, we'll i there. think our industry is a little bit different i was having to talk to my wife about this yesterday like the like influencer you know clothing influencer and just you know social influencers I feel like you have to be a million followers or more to make any impact because there's just so many of them. There's so many of these people that are doing it, and they all have so many followers, whereas we're a much more tight-knit community. Once you get to five, ten thousand, 10,000, you can start making waves in the community. It's mm-hmm. kind of what I'm thinking. So we are, we are well on our way. Um, and if you would like to join our Slack community, like we said, you can uh, go to tkcommunity.org, and there's a link right there on how to get into the Slack community, and that's where... Uh, all the fun happens. That is where we have all of our ongoing conversations, and uh, we're slowly building out the Facebook group, too. So we're real excited about that, and we are bringing in new vendors basically on a weekly basis at this point. Um, so we've got a lot of exciting things coming together. It is exciting. Facebook, that is a terrifying thing to think about. It. I mean, I, I, in my opinion, I want to keep building out LinkedIn, and I know we're, we're doing a pretty good job with that, too, but... And Facebook is so tough to keep clean with everyone's opinions and everybody's constant negativity, I think, is, is kind of the, the biggest thing. So we want to make sure we're keeping that pretty clean, too. Yeah. We, ne- we never want that place to just be a cesspool, is what we're going to call it. Right, right. So. Or, or just a meme deposit. I meme like deposit. A, I feel like a lot of these Facebook groups are just meme deposits at the end of the day. I mean, you guys know that picture of the guy with the stomach sitting on the top of a ladder. You know how many times I've seen that freaking picture in the past two months <laughs> in, like, every freaking Facebook group? It how just, much do you think that guy made to take that picture? Oh, my gosh. I really hope he's Somebody's making well. some money. <laughs> so oh. I, I guess we can slide on here and talk about the reason that we've got the one and only Mason Boards as well as uh, our dear friend Marco here. We wanted to talk about security and physical security, especially in the wake of, of all the things that are happening happening in the country. Um, you know, are there things from a technology standpoint that you guys can shed some light on that maybe could potentially help lower the number of instances of mass shootings, tragedies that are happening in our country? And I guess, Mason, we'll start with you. So... <clears throat> In my head, the where you'd want to start <clears throat> is actually at, at the fundamentals. So you can apply all the technology that you want to a problem, but if you don't have people that care or people that want to or, or a person that's monitoring the, the system, um, it, it in essence becomes useless. <clears throat> so a great example of this is... Um, you know, we're looking at these sites where we're putting thermal cameras up on the around the perimeter, and we could install a quarter million worth of thermal cameras. But if there's no one that is actually going to look when a notification comes through, then what's the point? We could throw a million dollars at cameras, and um, 
you know, have it down to if anything crosses the line, there's an alert that goes off. But if you don't have a person monitoring, if you don't have anyone taking action with it, the technology is useless. And um, what I've seen more and more, at least in my area, is a lack of end user training or a lack of um, care maybe from the integrator. Um, So what I mean by that is you go install a security camera system. Uh, We actually just had this with a customer that we're doing a takeover for. We actually were contracted to install the security camera system because the uh, person that, that won the contract was out of state. So they had us come in and put the security camera system in and they provided no end user training to the uh, to the business, and so we were always called upon to try to help them through issues, and that ended up they ended up losing that contract because basically it was a bunch of finger pointing, and no one wanted to take the time to sit down, and also no one really just took a step back and looked at. Okay, if I'm, what am I quoting here? Is this the right solution for the job, or is this just I have a Phillips head screwdriver in my in my tool bag, but I really need a flathead, but I'm going to try to force this tool to work. And um, I think that happens a lot of times where people only have solutions one, two, three, but they really need solutions four, five, six, and they just force they just force solutions one, two, three. Um, and and I really truly believe that a lot of problems, the technology is out there. The technology is out there. It is just the matter of implementing it and deploying it. And unfortunately those not only take um, capital expenditures, they have um, operating expenditures um, indefinitely. Um, we, we've seen this from, I'll give another example, a marijuana facility where, We've done one marijuana facility where they have a whole security staff. They have they have an, they do an excellent job of seeing who's on site, keeping track. Um, there's been multiple times where you're in the middle of doing something and the door opens up and they tell you to stop doing that because they're watching you at all times. Um, and out of all the other facilities that we've gone into, um, we don't see that where people just go, oh can I get it on my phone? Is that, that's all I need. And they're now taking a reactive approach instead of a proactive approach. Um, so in my mind, technology can help this to a point, but it won't fix the problem. Um, the fundamental problem, which I, I truly believe is, is people (laughs) and not just throwing more money at the problem. So and I mean, on that note, I definitely agree with Mason 100%. So I have a client who went with the lowest bidder for their camera system. And one of the issues was one of the providers had their wallet stolen out of their office during the day. And this guy, her office is right at a corner. So he put a camera facing this way and a camera facing this way. And the blind spot is her freaking door. And... When my installer came in, because he does their phone system, but also does cameras, he goes, does this guy not know that there's multi-head cameras out there? Like, you could have used one camera, used a multi-head, and you would have had no blind spots on that two hallways at the corner. You would have had her door covered, my server room covered, and both hallways covered. But this guy just was the lowest bidder, just throw the cameras in and be done with it. This is the same guy who I mentioned in the Slack community that just took my NVR and threw it on my table that I work on. And didn't think to mount it or do anything. So you're 100% right. It's It comes down to the installers that you're hiring. And my one other thought is, you're younger, Marco's younger. Do you think that's part of it, too? You guys are the younger generation. You're able to adapt to this new technology a lot faster because your industry is rapidly changing compared to what it was five years ago. No, I, I really don't. I I don't think it has something to do with age. I, I, they could p- play a factor in it, but there, the longer you run a business, I'm sure Marco could speak to this, is the more you work on just having a process for different things. So the companies that succeed and do things well are the companies that go, okay, we're going to 
we're going to install an Ava security camera system. And then we're going to have a process that goes, we do this, we do this, we do this, we do this. And the, I, I hearken that back to the 95-5 rule. 95% of businesses do 95% of the things all the same. It's that last 5% that is the most difficult part of running a company. Um, and I think that just comes all down down to process. Now, of course, the, I myself, I feel like I can understand technology maybe better than someone you know that's that's double my age. Mm-hmm. But the same goes for that person that's double my age understands the technology that they grew up with much better than I understand their technology. Um, so I really think it comes down to the company that has the time to dedicate to train the end user is typically going to be more expensive. You know, we are typically more expensive. Right. Um, we're always more expensive, actually. But we take the time to do the follow through. And uh, I, th- I think that's one of the reasons why, although we are never the lowest bidder, we are booked out for basically the rest of the year at this point because people value that um, as they get to, to know us and understand us more. Right. And what you mentioned right there, that harkens back again to my same customer. I literally had to go in last week and tell her all your cameras that he put in all need to be repositioned. Like one camera isn't even hitting the door that's supposed to hit. Another camera is eating like 40 percent of the frame is the wall. Like just stupid choices on camera positioning. And he didn't even sit down with her and go over like, are these angles all good? He just said, here's the cameras. Do you want it on your phone? Okay, (laughs) we're Mm -hmm. done. Oh, so that <laughs> I walked into a business where they uh, they had probably I think eighty cameras installed. I mean, it was, it was a fairly sizable system, and probably forty access control points. And it fascinated me. The company did a wonderful job. The install looked really good. Um, but when I finally took the system over, the camera views were garbage. They used the cheapest cameras, and I know from ordering those same cameras that the model that they chose was the cheapest but also had a lens issue with it but that's i only know that because i ordered one and i did a field test in my office before i quoted the job Mm -hmm. and they clearly didn't do that this had been one of their first jobs and there was just so many little problems with it it was so far out of date there was it was under there was like 16 different vulnerabilities that it had um so we took it over, and now they're going to have to pay for us to come in there and repoint all the cameras. Um, but it, it's just crazy how they did a good job installing it. The They did a Mercury access control system. What looked, looked great. The cameras looked installed looked pretty good. Um, but then the follow-through on the finish was just terrible. And their security was also awful. You could tell they just used the same default password for all their systems. And it's like, as a security company, really? That's pathetic. That's that's the other thing that I question with some of these installs that I see is your security installers and the crap that you do is outrageous. Um, I had a client that took over a used car location, and the camera installers that did the install, all the cameras for the outside come out the wall, fully exposed wire, about 15 feet up the wall, fully exposed up over the parapet, and then go out to all the outdoor cameras. Mm-hmm. So somebody could easily come over with it six foot ladder and cut all your outdoor cameras and where the bundle comes up is butted up against woods so you can easily come in no one can see you you can cut all the cameras that are on the parking lot on the main drive everything and there's no more view of the outside and i just think to myself like your literal job is security like this is point one that somebody can just cut all these wires and you just lost all your security i I don't get it it's the problem that in the, in the security field, so I'll back up a little bit. So if you go and you get a home automation system, there's a level of professionalism that you'll expect. There's two competitors here that do home automation systems. One is higher end than us. Um, their installs are okay, and one is about the same quality as us from the equipment that we install, but their quality, like their finish work, isn't as good. Um, but... I would say if those two guys did an install, I wouldn't look down upon that customer. Like I wouldn't say, okay, that install like is going to be junk. It's not going to be good. Um, 
but it's not going to be bad. And But there's a higher bar of entry with security cameras. Anyone and their dog can go buy, go to Sam's Club and buy a pack and say, I'm a, I'm a professional security installer. And as long as it works enough, you know, even if they just put a monitor up and they say, well, your phone can't connect to it. I don't know how to make that work. But, you know, you can see them on the monitor. People generally are like, okay, that's good enough for me. I spent three grand and I have 16 cameras up. I, what do I have to complain about? Um, and that's because the barrier of entry is so low. Right. And some people just stay there because they're satisfied with that. And then, and then typically what ends up happening is those companies uh, become alarm monitoring companies, which is the scarier thing. <laughs> Right. Well, and, and it's, you know, a good example of that, too, is, right, I had a customer, a long-time customer. He goes, oh, we're going to stop using uh, your Eagle Eye service. I said, did something happen? I said, we've been dealing with you, you know, five years. You know, you've always seemed to really enjoy it. Oh, we're going to go with Ring. I said, you know, I'm not trying to be rude. I said, but what made you make that decision? Well, it's uh, it's just easier for me. I said, to what to what level? Like, what, what, what's what's the reasoning? What's your backstory about it? You know, you have two kids. You have a wife. I said you you really, from originally you wanted something that was going to give you the real analytics to it. Oh well, it's just. I said, is it a marketing ploy? I said, is it because you see it so much you think that it's the greatest thing since sliced bread? He goes, well, I, I don't really know. I said, look. I said it's fine. It's totally your decision. I said, but don't make a decision based on everybody else having the same thing and thinking it's better. I said. I wouldn't want you to take your Honeywell system out that we maintain for you, your alarm system, and go and put a Simply Safe in or a Ring. I said because those are not the same systems. So it's it's educational awareness too, you know. And it's terrible to see that people are just seeing things so commercialized, and they think, oh, this is must be the best thing because everybody else right. is doing it. But it's just people are throwing dollars at it. That's what it really comes down to. Well, and and it's funny that you mentioned Ring. So. One of my customers is getting bought out tomorrow, one of my dealerships, and I was talking to the director of IT for the purchasing uh, dealership group, and he goes, well, we need to take over the cameras because we're not going to put in cameras yet because we know they have some. He goes, what do you have? Do you have Ubiquity? Do you have um, uh, Hick system? I go, no, no, they, they put ring cameras in themselves. He goes, all right, it looks like we have to put cameras in on Wednesday then. It's just... It's mind-boggling. This this customer was all about saving money. So instead of putting in like a Muzak system with you know normal speakers and all that, it's four Sono speakers throughout the whole entire dealership. It's ring cameras throughout the whole entire dealership, and it's just let's cut every corner that we can, and it's ridiculous. And on that camera note, this question's for both uh, Marco and Mason. I know both of you recently switched to Ava. I know Mason, you were on Hanwa for a while. And, uh, Marco, you've used Axis and Hick and all that. What made you guys switch to Ava? Who wants to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, if we can, before we even jump on the Ava train, I, I want to go back to the initial topic because yeah. now I've got a list of, like, 50 questions that I've been writing <laughs> down that, that I really want to touch on that I think are really important to yeah. this, this entire conversation that we've, we've spiraled into. But I want to make sure we go back on topic. We want to focus right now on... Could there could technology really possibly help prevent? So, Marco, you, you didn't get to answer that question yet. Well, I, I I would probably echo what Mason says. You know, I mean, it it like I would say, digital security is only as good as the physical security in place, right? You could put access control on a door, but if you can prop a door open, you have no way to activate any type of alarm or alert or someone there to monitor that. It's not going to do anybody any good. It's just like a police station, right? You can arm every door in the world that you want in there. You get inside, the only thing that's going to stop you is a guy with a gun. That's really the, the that's physical security. So I think it, it to this point in this stage of the, of the world, you need a combination of both technology and physical presence in order to stop a threat. And that's always been really my forefront statement to everybody. Oh, yeah, you know, access control is great, even for your house, right? Oh, well, it's it's a battery-operated lock. Well, it's a battery-operated lock. Have a fi another a secondary lock on that door, so at night, if that lock fails, you have a physical thing to stop someone from coming in. So that's really, I mean, my take on it and the long and short of it. I, I no, did, and, and that's fair. I didn't want to jump on a tangent, a slight tangent, that just bugs the living hell out of me, is people that install 
mag locks when there is a much more better option like a door strike. <laughs> it's just mag lock it, is a last resort. It's a last resort. It should only be used if you cannot find or afford anything else, and the owner should be very much aware of what they're doing. <laughs> and the the thing that fascinates me is it's for some people the first option because they just don't care. They're like, oh. I'm the lowest number. I can put this in without getting anyone else involved. And they don't care that, you know, they want to do this at their own house or their own business, but yet they will go do it for a customer that may not be aware that when the power goes out, the magnet stops working and their door is practically unlocked. That and then putting Rexes in and not setting, and then just by default, the Rex unlocks the door. So you can just put a can of air in and unlock any door in a facility just i went into a high security facility and that's what the company did i said we need to take this over and fix all this for you because it's just crazy i mean at the end of the day it sounds like it goes back to the integrator if the integrator doesn't vet his products correctly doesn't install them correctly you could throw millions of dollars of security at a problem and one little point of failure is going to screw you Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, because somebody didn't program it correctly. I, I always say, look, anybody can sell you anything, right? You can go to any dealership in the world, buy any car you want from any dealer. But if you have a personal uh, you know, interaction with that person, with that company, and you like what they sell and how they do it, that's, that's what you're selling. You're selling right. you. You're not selling the product because you can put any camera, any piece of wire in, anything you want. But if you know what, if you're doing it better than Joe Blow across the street and he's doing the same stuff, that's what you're selling. You're selling the quality mm -hmm. product that you're providing, not what you're necessarily manufacturing, you know? So one of the topics, again, kind of circling back, and I, I, I promise I'll stop circling back to, can you know, technology save the world. But one of the, the questions that was asked in the group was, what about things like AI, right? Artificial intelligence, right? That's starting to be built into a lot of security systems, and, and Ava being one of them, right? What things are companies like Ava and artificial intelligence doing to kind of help security and kind of help prevent some of these tragedies that the country's having? And, and Mason, I think his camera died, so Mark, I'll let you answer <laughs> that one first. Well, I mean, the biggest thing is, like you're saying, Ray, is artificial intelligence, right? The systems are getting smarter, they're learning, they're adapting. And that's to go back to Brandon, what your, your statement was earlier, that's really what drew us to it is the mm. fact that their system learns. Now, it's both scary and amazing to see that this technology can actually do this, but when you have a system that you can put in place that will adapt and learn the environment that it's in, that means someone in you know Northern California could have the same system installed and be learning that atmosphere and that geographical location. But in Manhattan, you could be having something totally different learned. But the two systems can then take all that data and say, hey, this is what we have found overall between all these different algorithms and, and learning technologies, you know, and that's, I think, what's really big. And now, you know, like some people say, oh, it's the flavor of the month. I got to tell you, this stuff isn't going away. It's just going to further adapt. And as other companies see, for example, what Ava is doing, they're going to jump on it. Like a couple of weeks ago, Motorola bought them out out, out of nowhere. I mean... Obviously, it was in the it was in the works, but my my rep didn't know. The director of sales didn't know. He's like, we didn't know any of this was coming down the pipe. But it just goes to show you between that and you know, I mean, Motorola had a couple buyouts in the last couple months. They're they're buying things left and right because they can see this technology and how it's being enhanced and learned and everything is just evolving. I mean, it's so it's wild. You can't keep up with it. I do have a question about that buyout. I did not know that happened. And because this kind of ties into what happened in the MSP community with Kaseya buying Datto, is there any concern that you guys have with Motorola buying Ava of them just tying it into a Vigilon and saying, bye-bye, Ava, all your technology is in a Vigilon now, and you guys get screwed? I mean, I think a buyout of any sort is always concerning, right? You don't know how things are going to adapt and change. I mean, the big thing on that I've always seen is that you lose touch with your salespeople, your mm -hmm. technical leads, that all goes away. It's like a whole new world. And then, I mean, I had it happen with Meraki, right? I was very close in the beginning when they first really started with Google, when, when Google was funding them. 
and then everything just kind of faded off and everybody disappeared. And then you lose that relationship, right? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think with this specific case, I think Motorola is going to kind of let Ava run and do its thing. But you never know what time can tell, you know? Yeah. I I think I was really worried about it at first. Um, I personally think they sold way too soon. Um, I think they should have waited another three or four years and gone maybe even public. Um, the problem is, is they, they sold out soon because I think everything that was happening in Russia at the, and, uh, it's been interesting because the, the connections that I've had with the people there were very strong. We were doing maybe two meetings a quarter where they would come, we'd grab dinner, talk about what's going on, what's coming down the pipe. And then those kind of faded away. Then it's gone, you know, and I, it takes two to four weeks for someone to get back to me. Um, the company itself. Now, when I say two to four weeks, I mean like systems engineer, it's not his fault. He's extremely busy. My sales guy, he usually gets back to me within the day. Um, but it used to be, Hey, I got this problem. I'd like to solve it. Okay, yeah, let's figure out how we want to solve it. Right now, it's yeah, we got a big development timeline. Don't know when we're going to be able to fit that in. Um, yeah, gonna gonna let you know on that one a little bit later. And so, I mean, it was like every two months there was a a crazy new feature that would have taken any other company a year. You know, they're like, oh, hey, we're coming out with LPR. We're, we're going to go down that path. And then three months later, okay, we have LPR, and it actually works better than most anything on the market right now. And it's our first attempt. It's like, wow, that's that's crazy. Um, Ava is such a, such a duh camera system. It just it makes sense. And you kind of have to disconnect yourself um, from – the security world to understand that this is the way that I think most any camera system is going to end up going in the future. I mean, you already see it with a ring or a nest where you just buy the camera, plug it in and it just works. And why it's taken so long for the business space to get to this point, it boggles my mind. And I think that's why they were growing at, you know, 200, 300% year over year, because I don't have to worry about putting a recorder on site. I just plug a camera in and I go to the next one and I'm done. And I don't have to worry about it. And because the cameras, everything's built in, if there's a problem, the company can't look and go, well, it's a it's a network problem or it's a this problem or that problem. I'm just buying the piece of hardware and plugging it in. Um, and the things are built pretty rock solid. Um, it, it, it's, I uh, compare it to if you had to, every time you had to deploy a network, like switches and routers, you'd have to buy a server to manage it. You'd go, that's asinine, and that's crazy. Why are we doing that? And that's the same thing with cameras. Why don't we just have storage built into the cameras, and then you just connect them to a remote hosting interface and, and just do it that way? Because that, that makes a whole lot more sense to me in the 21st century than having a centralized recorder where we have to run cables and everything has to be vlan off, and it just seems like the old way of doing it. So. Well, and it, and it functions, you know, like you said, Mason, it, it works. I mean, I don't I don't think to date I know a system that as far as getting it fired up, the analytics, the way it works, as fast as Ava. And I no. think that's that's probably what caught Motorola's eye. You mm-hmm. know, they're it's it's technology, it's the way it's going. I mean even even Eagle Eye, for example, now they're like, Oh, let's do uh search indexing so we can say, Oh, Man with the black shirt and blue jeans just walked in the door. They're all doing the same thing because how, how do you grow? You don't grow unless you start to learn off of what other people are doing. It's the same thing as anything else. So back to the AI with Ava, does it work how some of our MSP tools work with AI where it's community learning too? So all the different Ava systems are all learning off each other? Or is it just your individual system learns just by itself? No, your your individual system learns by itself. I mean, all the AI models aren't, um, they're done like a person model. I mean, mm-hmm. that's not, that may improve a little bit, but I haven't heard of them like, oh, we're going to train, we're going to continue to train our AI model. They, they train on your site based on anomaly. So 
Um, the, the one thing I found with their system is you have to have a fairly routine schedule. Um, and if you go off that schedule, it, it screws up on the anomaly side. So like at my shop, you know, on the weekends, I may be here on the weekends. I may not be here on the weekends. And it, it sometimes will call those anomalies when I come here on the weekend. Um, so it's not quite as in depth. What I would like to see is a way to, um, like if it did pull an anomaly to flag and say, Hey, this is not an anomaly for these reasons. Like it is a blue Ford F-150 truck. That is my truck. I am not an anomaly. And based on what I've seen from others, that is possible. Um, it sounds a little crazy, but that, that is possible. Um, Ava is very, they go, okay, we can definitely accomplish this one task. So we're going to do that. We're going to do it very well. Um, I would like to see them expand and do more crazy stuff like that, where you could really dive down if you wanted to and uh, and make those intricate rules. Um, I don't think they'll ever do that because they're a company that's more focused on, oh, I can w- walk up to a Fortune 200 company and just plug cameras in wherever I want on the network and it just works and I walk away from it and I never have to talk to anyone for five years because the software is so easy to use. It's like the um, Rocky mindset, right? Yeah, and it, it, the more that I've worked with them, it, it's my favorite camera company by far, um, but there's some quirks, and I think a Vigilon will probably help Motorola. I think the Vigilon side of Motorola will help really work those issues out. Um, for example, you get a usually with any decent camera from Hanwha or Axis, you can adjust every little parameter that you want, um, you can't do that with Ava. You have one slide. It's HDR on, HDR off. And on the bullet cameras, you can't even set what you want for focus. Um, it's just autofocus. And so that is really frustrating to me, saying that that, that camera is a over $2,000 camera, and you can't do those basic things. And they're getting lit up on that because their dev team... I said, well, all of our settings should be automatic and it should just work. And everyone's going, you know, if you're paying over 2000 for a camera, I should be able to adjust whatever the hell I want to adjust and you can't tell me otherwise. Um, so that's that's been a little – I think Motorola will help with that. Um, I truly believe if they weren't with Motorola, those issues might have been worked out already or they would have been getting done a lot quicker. Um, but I think Motorola is kind of keeping them in a more – confined box where they have stricter development timelines then as we get to it you know we'll get it done as we can um so but and, overall and that goes back company. to your point yeah that goes back to your point though that you mentioned earlier 95 percent rule right 95 mm-hmm. percent of those features work perfectly for 95 percent of the clientele that they're selling those to so in their opinion those settings don't need to be changeable yeah and it sounds very familiar with some of the things that we've talked about in our group lately, where as far as I'm concerned, if you're spending the money on the equipment and you're branding yourself as an enterprise solution, then you need to open those features up to your installers, to your dealers, and to your integrators. Otherwise, we're not going to go to you, period. We can't. Because what if you need those, those cameras to do something else? What if you need to maybe focus that camera in a different section? for a certain reason, as opposed to just dead focus on the middle of the picture. Yeah. It, it happens, right? You, you can you can do that with Ava. You can say, okay, I'm going to put a cloud connector and then I'm going to put Axis or Hanwha cameras up. And if you, again, it comes back to planning. If you plan out the job, you'll be fine. Um, but if you just go, okay, I'm going to throw all these Ava cameras up and they should work great because the price point should says that they should work great um you can be a little bit disappointed uh but again you also have to kind of go back to the customer at the end of the day looks at and goes that looks great you know for me i go the shadows are a little too dark and like someone could really hide behind here and i don't like how soft the image is because of how they're processing their hdr and you know, their shutter speed is way too high or way too low, or I want to adjust the frame rate on this for X, Y, or Z. And I, I, the only way you can do that is if you go get an Axis camera, a Hanwha camera, and pull it into the system via their one of their cloud connectors. Um, but, again, that comes down to planning. Uh, I will say, I think on the 
on the camera side of things, um, <laughs> as mine goes Speaking out. Of cameras. <laughs> uh, on the camera side of things, I really feel like for most camera companies, it's not a 95-5 rule. It's more like a 65-35 rule where it's just the bar is so low for camera companies. A perfect example of this is OpenEye. I thought OpenEye was like the bee's knees. And then when after, what, three, four years now, they still have the same problems that they had three, four years ago. It's just the bar is so low. Uh, WiseNet Wave, great. WiseNet Wave is great. But they just have, they'll have some weird problems here and there. There's really no way to fix it. Their support is non-existent. Um, OpenEye has great support, but their, their issues that they run into are just so asinine. And It's like a refusal to develop. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You get, you know... Look, salesmen or sales reps and, and tech always talk to each other because they want to know what the dealer heartaches are, are, are developing. And even, you know, my, for example, my Ava rep used to work for Hanwha and he, he's saying the same stuff that Mason's saying, you know, he's like, support has always been an issue. They don't listen. They don't want to, these companies don't want to adapt. So, you know, hopefully with Motorola purchasing Ava, they don't have that same issue and they look at it from a different perspective. You know, that's, that's the big hope. I, I, I think part of the problem too, is some of these companies see it as, Hey, we, we made it the 60% of the way. Now we can just cash in screw development. Development costs money. Let's just cash in on the profits and maybe we'll develop things down the road. Who knows? Let's see if the, we get more investment. The one thing that I'm very worried about with Ava is that there's going to be a mass exodus in at the end of this year, first to next year, um, from Ava because when Motorola bought them, from my understanding, pretty much everyone has to stay on for the first year, and then from that they can leave. And talking with people and hearing what their salaries were at Ava, they are going to maybe get cut in half, if not more, when you know, now that Motorola has bought them out. I mean, just the, the amount of money a sales rep was making was, I mean, close to 300 is what I heard. And a vigil on Motorola is not, not able to pay that amount of money for a sales rep. So I think they may lose a lot of talent. And that's why they grew so quickly is they had all this great talent. Um, and now that that's going to be leaving and going out of the next great thing, um, I, the software might stay the same for the next three to four years with little incremental improvements, unfortunately. I hope not. I really hope not, but I have a feeling it might happen. And I mean, that was my fear with the Kaseya Datto purchase is after that year, everyone's going to disappear. And what's going to happen to development? What's going to happen to security? What's going to happen to support? Like, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you guys are worried about physical security, but because of how Ava integrates with its cloud, you also have to worry about that digital security too, and if there is a mass exodus, like is that going to be a concern for you guys? Also, are they protecting you on the uh, digital security side? Is, there, is it going to be another Verkata incident um, no, a year from no. now? No, that's uh, I, that wouldn't happen. Um, just from the way that, so one, the company has all the the stickers, so to speak, all the stamps to show that they're secure and they're, they're very mm-hmm. secure. And then also they came from, they were born out of jazz networks, which is a security and cybersecurity company. So, okay. um, you can just tell by the way that they do things that that ain't going to happen. For example, so Phoenix integrates with security camera systems. Um, the way that open eye transmits its video from OpenEye to Phoenix, from my understanding, I could be wrong on this, is not encrypted, or if it is, it's very weak encryption. Uh, Ava refused to do it that way with Phoenix. They have contracts in place, I mean, where they need to integrate thousands of cameras. And Ava basically said, nope, we're not going to do that. You need to do this the secure way through RSTPS, and mm. if we're if you don't do that, we're not... We're not going to support it. Sorry. <laughs> and I, I I really like that. I like that a company is willing to put security in front of everything else, especially everything that goes on these days. So Right, right. No, I mean, that's huge. It ties back to what Ray had the whole topic about. I mean, if you can get into these cloud cameras like what happened with Fricata, you could have all the physical security in place. But if they have control of the cameras, 
they can figure things out and they can uh, kind of bypass the physical security in certain places. Right. And, and that's, that that's the one purpose, of the scary things. Yeah. Right. Of, of having these systems like a big thing with, I'm sure, most integrators between access control and surveillance is that, you know, dispatch or even the, the law enforcement or patrolmen outside want to see it from their cars so they can see what's going on inside. Yeah. If you're not logging into an app or you're just going to a secured website, that solves a lot of the problem right there, too, because now they're not having to worry about getting into a different piece of software and it's on the computer and who's got access to it. And they're logging in even with two factor. You know, I mean, yeah, that's a big a big thing also. So I so think that's big. Is that starting to become a thing with these cloud camera providers like Ava, where law enforcement does have their own independent login to where they could go to an incident, they can get on in their computer in the car, see what's going on before they walk into the incident and try to have some ops awareness of what's going on inside and not just walk in blind? Yeah, at least in, for us. Most, I if not all it. of them, they have access. Like Dispatch has a login, and they have it up on their video wall for you know, schools or even, I mean, hell, even condo boards have it. Yeah. If they want to give them access to it, they have access to it. You know, I mean, we get the requests all the time. I yeah. don't know if they all do it from the cars. I've had some officers do it from their, their patrol vehicles, but most of the time it's dispatch or operations that's monitoring that end of the feed. Yeah. I mean, that, that's Philly huge. had this, uh, yeah, Philly had this big initiative, and I don't want to go into specifics on it because I'm not an expert on it. But Philly had this initiative for quite a while where they were giving, the city of Philadelphia was giving institutions like schools, uh, banks, facilities, significant dollars in order to put cameras up on their buildings as long as they could have access to them. Right. So the city of Philadelphia would give a, a school $50,000 worth of cameras, making sure that they had access to those just in case something happened around the property. And I think there needs to be more programs like that. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. Just for your operational awareness of an incident, you're not going in blind. At least you have some sense of what's going on on the inside, and you're not just running in and let's see what happens. I, I About a year ago, I would have probably thought the exact same way. I tend to lean a little away from that because I feel like uh, it, it opens up the door for some bad actors to do some really nasty stuff. And, um, we had an apartment complex that we were working at and we talked to them about doing that. Cause I mean, they, the cops would be over there almost two times a day and it was just like, why don't we just connect your system to theirs and make, make all this problems go away. Then you can just call them and they can jump on and look at it. And they didn't want to do that. They're just like, I don't want big brother looking over all my stuff all the time. And I can I can understand that. Like I, I wouldn't want to connect my office system to Big Brother. You know, you, then you don't know who's watching you. And I wouldn't really want to work in a facility where you know I don't mind if Steve, my boss, knows that I'm leaving because I have the relationship with that person. But I don't really want to have you know 50 different people downtown having access to you know what I'm doing at my office. So I can I can see the benefit of it. But I also kind of just feel from an American standpoint that that opens up a door to some ugly stuff that we hope never happens, but we know certainly will. So, Well, I think it needs and to that. be controlled, too. It's not just like everybody's got access to this. You know, if someone at an operation desk has it and they're giving that information or, you know, even even my guys, right, with the dash cams. Oh, we don't want to be watched. I said, guys, I'm not looking at you. Pick your nose. This is for your coverage and my coverage to know if something happens. And you know what? The first time something happened, they're like, do you have that footage? <laughs> because they realize that it's not there for, for spying. It's for protection. You know? Yep. Well, and I, I can think of two instances, Barco, in the last six months that those cameras have, have covered your, your business's ass, man. So. One thought that I just had that ties with, in with the uh, AI could there become a time to where an incident does happen and the camera system sends a secure login to a point of contact at law enforcement says, here's your secure login to the camera system. This is going to expire after 24 hours to where you're giving them just a little view in to look at whatever's happening at that instance. And then their access is revoked after 24 hours. Maybe that's one way around it. 
So you could you could kind of accomplish this with like a central monitoring station, which is already kind of done. Mm. So we're doing that with a client where we're putting thermal cameras around their facility with some AVA cameras, and so we use with a system called Checked, and we're able to pull in. Uh, camera streams to the central monitoring station and you could even have it set up to where until the system is armed it's not pushing out any data um so then once you arm it and you're not on site anymore you don't really care what who's looking at it because no one's there uh, right. but then if someone sees that central monitoring station they can send that clip over to the cops they can see that clip and and dispatch from there yeah yeah it sounds like technology is really bringing a lot of more tools into your toolbox as a physical security integrator. And it sounds like it's, it's a really exciting time. I mean, this is stuff that we didn't have five years ago. I mean, five, ten years ago, you were, we were still talking about coax cameras and analog cameras. Unfortunately, and, it's still being installed, which just oh, boggles yeah, no, it's, my it's mind. True, very true. Or, or what's even worse is I, I – uh, there's <laughs> – we have four Dairy Queens – in in our little town here and i don't know why we need four of them but we do (laughs) and they wanted security cameras so we quoted them and then the other competitor which is like 45 minutes away from me i'm right i'm five minutes away from all these dairy queens they quoted conveniently five (laughs) minutes from all these yeah yeah they quote it with cat five with coax cameras with balance and it just and the customer's like, well, you quoted 5 megapixel, they quoted 5 megapixel, you quoted cat, they quoted cat, but yet you're more expensive. Why are you putting racks. a rack in? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, and they, they're they using no, no name brands, it's just like whatever's cheapest on the ADI shelf that week. And mm-hmm. it fascinates me where you're like, why would, why would you even spend the money? I have this, okay, so a little side tangent. So a customer of mine, they're putting in, these uh, videofied cameras around their perimeter. I don't know if you've ever heard of videofied, but it's a it's a LTE camera. It's battery powered. You have to replace the batteries every six to eight months. Don't call and it a camera, Mason. It's not. It's verified it's video a, detection. Uh-huh. So <laughs> Just it's saying, a piece of junk. It is. It's a That's piece of junk. <laughs> and they, uh, man, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, so they're not really working. Right, so they put up these cameras. Like, oh, it's really cheap. You know, they spend a hundred grand on one of their locations with these "quote unquote" cheap cameras, and then they have an ongoing maintenance of it every year of like twenty to thirty thousand. Okay, the cameras don't work, and I tell the head of security, he says, "Why don't we use these in in like uh, temporary areas to secure it?" I said, "What's the point?" I said, "Well, well, you know, they they do work." I said, "When? When have they actually worked?" Well, I said, why don't we go to Menards or Lowe's and get a fake camera with a little blinky red light on it? Because, one, that's going to be ten times cheaper and just as effective. And it was like he almost wanted to argue with me, but he didn't have anything to stand on. Because he's like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. That's. I said, look, I just saved you $100,000. You want to pay me $50,000 as a consultation fee? So this, this circles me back. Man, I gotta stop using these damn conference calls. Right. Circle me back there. Circle back. We'll 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 circle back on that. As per circle. my previous email. Yeah, as per my previous email, we would have an entire podcast just based on stupid conference call talks. Um, but this actually brings me back to a question that you brought up earlier. How do you bid those jobs, Mason? Like, I know that your work is quality, right? I know that because I see your work and I've worked with you. But how does Dairy Queen, in this example, know? hey, you know what, this guy quoted me this and this guy quoted me that. Mason is significantly more expensive. How are you winning that bid? And maybe not the Dairy Queen bid, but just mm-hmm. in general, how are you winning that bid? Um, educating the customer is the is the biggest thing. Um, someone can tell if you're just there to sell them something or if you're trying to actually solve their problem. And I think a lot of uh, companies, as they grow – they they develop a good name for themselves, which is great, but then they have this disconnect where they have a dedicated sales guy and a dedicated systems engineer and then a dedicated guy that like, you know, super oversees the techs. And you start to then fragment your company to the point where there's such a big disconnect that the end result is junk. And 
that's I think that's where I come in a lot different where I know I'm on the line here. What I tell you is going to work. I'm going to make work and I'm going to tell you if I feel like it may not work. Um, so a great example, of this is a, is a customer working on right now, the same one that's doing the thermal cameras. They went out to six different vendors and we were the smallest vendor, like by magnitudes of smaller and every other vendor, Stanley and convergent, they wanted to sell them three locations, big systems, you know, spend a million dollars with them. Okay. And so I came to them and I said, why don't we do an evaluation? Why don't we buy four of these cameras, spend 40 grand and let's see if it works or not. And if it doesn't work, then you only, you're only out 40 grand. But right now you spent a half a million dollars between what you currently are, have been doing and you're, they're telling you to go spend a million more. I'm just telling you spend 40. Let's figure out if this thing works or not. If it doesn't, we'll go our separate ways. It's not a big deal. But then I'm not selling you a million dollar worth of stuff that I don't know how to operate. And you're not trying to push a huge CapEx expenditure. And then if it fails, then you get fired. So now it's a win-win for everyone. It's just because I take a step back. I take my mind out of the dollars and cents. And I just look at the problem in front of me. And I feel like so many businesses, as they grow, they just look at the dollars and cents and they don't look at just the human problem in front of them. And they just, you just got to disconnect and go, what's the best thing? The same thing I tell my guys. Yeah, we need to shoot for getting this job done within the 80 hours. But the more important thing is to train our new guys on how to do the job the best that they can. Because that will pay dividends down the road. Getting the job done on time but the new guy doesn't know what he's doing because you've only had him make patch cables the whole time has not, we have lost money on that job at that point. If you would have spent, if that job would have gone 20 hours over, but that guy knew how to do half that job. Now that job is saving us money. That job was on time. And I think that's a really hard thing for people to wrap their heads around for some reason. Um, just got to look at the big picture. And I think, if you educate the customer and you actually try to solve their problem, people start, look, they start look, looking past the dollar signs and they just go, okay, I want to work with this guy. I don't want to work with anyone else. So to take this step further and Marco, I kind of want you to answer this one. Let's talk about the guys, girls, people in our community, right? That are starting a new business or are now starting that security business. And they know they can go to, Lowe's Home Depot and buy a 16 camera system for 500 bucks. And this is now their go to market strategy. They're going to sell this system to a customer, right? Because they can come in with a better price. They can offer cost savings. How do you help that business owner understand that your business will actually grow more if you sell them a quality product over just coming in as the lowest bid? Because I know you see that in your world all the time. It, it's it's hard it's very hard you know kind of like what mason said right you know i mean there's other people out there that that can do what we do um there's bigger companies there's smaller companies i mean we lose jobs to smaller companies all the time and i will say probably 30 percent of the time we get a call back and they say hey this guy didn't do it the way we thought it was going to be done and you know you it's unfortunate that you have to take the time to explain it to them and then you don't win the opportunity but the hardest thing I think from my perspective and you know this is again just my opinion is that people don't want to listen they want to hear what they want to hear and that's not going to change no matter how good you are no matter if you're a good salesman you're a good businessman or you're just being goddamn honest because people just like you guys are saying they just see dollars and it's unfortunate because dollars don't quantify a quality product if it's cheaper or if I'm going up against an ADT. If they're 10 times my cost, you're going with ADT because you like the name. It's not the quality of service. I mean, I can probably count, you know, on at least 10 fingers how many times we've taken jobs from bigger businesses because they're, like Mason said, they lose the touch. They're not, they're not interacting with the customer. They're too far down the line. The, the boss doesn't know what's going on. I mean, I think that's a big thing about why I keep my, my head in the game so much 
you know, you can have five guys, you could have 50 guys. If you don't know what everybody's doing, you're not a good owner, just case in point. So going up against a smaller company or someone that's going, you know, circling back, right? To, you know, let's say like a Home Depot or a Costco. Look, you could put in a product to that caliber, but that's not going to say that your your quality of work is bad. It's just saying that, hey, I can do this for you at this price, and here's option A, B, and C, right? Someone's starting out, maybe that's what they, they want to do. That's what they can afford. Not everybody can jump into a $2,000 AVA camera and say, well, I'm going to charge you fifty grand for three cameras because I know the quality of work that I can provide. But if you're doing the basis of quality work, the way that we all do it, then you could put in a low grade camera and maybe in the future say, Hey, I think we should change this camera out or we should change this recorder out because I have now learned that there are better systems out there. And I think that'll benefit you, right? People rag on Unify, but you know what? It does what it needs to do. And it's got some cute bells and whistles. I'll call it, but down the line, you still have the, the backbone in place that you could change and put in an AVA camera if you wanted to. And to second that, you know, I started my whole company on putting in Unify cameras. I That was the first thing that I ever installed, and I did a terrible job at it. But the thing was I kept iterating, and you, you just keep pushing yourself to get better. Just because you can't go buy an AVA camera, just because you can't go to Motorola, just because you can't go install Control 4, doesn't mean there's not customers for you. The problem that you'll probably run into if, if you start by installing Unify cameras is if you try to do a good job and you keep doing a good job, is you'll outgrow your customers. You will The customers that got you started are no longer going to want to pay $2,000 a camera, but you're going to have to understand that you those customers that got you started you try to take care of them the best you can um but you also have to move on and and keep going up and working towards and iterating and getting better and better and better and like i said i if you you can always find something to fit the budget it's just a matter of how you do it just because a ring camera is cheap doesn't mean you have to get a ring stick stick up cam. You could get one that hardwires in to the floodlights, and that's not a bad choice. I mean, if it works, it works, and if if that's what you want for your house, but then recommend that to someone. Don't say, okay, we're gonna get a solar panel and stick it up on your roof with 3M tape, and stick this camera with the drywall anchor in your soffit. That's gonna look like garbage. Um, it's about making the right choices. I mean, any anything can most anything can made to look good if you take the time and you think about it. So. So I, I think the advice that we can give and, and take from this, and you guys tell me if I'm saying it wrong, but somewhat good at wordsmithing, <laughs> is at the end of the day, make sure that you're giving your customer quality install, a quality product that you feel you can stand behind, and make sure that no matter what you're doing and, and what you're installing, that you're installing it to the caliber of work that you would do if you were charging 20 times more. Right. Take your time and, and do it right, you know, no yep, matter what you put do in. Do it right, and, and also make sure... Um, that you can stand behind it, right? Make sure that you're going to offer that support. Make sure that you're going to... Um, I'm losing my train of thought here. Make sure that you're <laughs> going to offer that same level of expertise and never... Here, here's where it is. Never settle, right? Never compromise your integrity or your company or your name or your product just to win a sale. Right. You always want to put your that's name on important. it. That's the way you would look at it. You know, I've... I mean, I've had customers say to me, like, hey, can you, you know, on this job, we don't want anybody's name on anything. And it's funny because, you you know, the way I look at it is like, okay, you guys approved a Hike Vision camera. You're going to have that crappy name on it. Excuse me for saying it. I mean, we sell, sold a lot of it. But you're going to put that name on it. They're going to say, well, who the hell is Hike Vision? Instead of it saying Enterprise on it, knowing that you have a quality product. Mm-hmm. So it, it really just comes down to, to that, you know. Make the backbone of it look perfect and pristine, whether it's a Lorex camera or an access camera. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and one other key takeaway that I took from uh, Mason's conversation through this whole thing is do your due diligence at the end of the day for that client. Each client is different. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution for whether it be IT, physical security, digital security. There's not a one-size-fits-all customer. Mason's not going to go into a pizza shop and install the same cameras that he's going to have to install in a dispensary because their security requirements in that pizza shop 
are night and day different than what the dispensary needs. So do your due diligence at the end of the day and do right by your customer. Now, the the second thing I'd like to bring up with that is sometimes doing right by your customer seems to be different than what you may think. So what I mean by that is we sell Ava for two reasons. One, the shit just works. Two, we get recurring revenue. So people have the stigma that having recurring revenue is this just evil thing that, oh, I'm just ripping someone off. No, what you're doing is providing them better support. You have to have money to survive. So if you can take a system like an Ava camera system and I can install that and I can make X amount of dollars per camera per year and I can put that money in my pocket to reinvest it into the company that I can provide better support and the, the customer values that. I, I cannot tell you how many times I have sat down and demoed a WiseNet Wave system against an Ava system. And the customer 90% of the time picks the Ava system because he values that. He or she yeah. values that. They'll go, okay, the Hanwha system is five grand, the Ava system is seven, eight grand. But I can get an alert anytime someone comes in and that alert's going to be accurate every single time. You're sold. Sold. You, yeah. Oh, I'll pay. I'll pay the extra however many you know two thousand dollars a year it is, because they value that. And that's the thing is, so many people they spend, they build quotes with their money. They don't build quotes with the customer's money. There's customers that have that uh, that dispensary. They spent close to a million dollars. I don't have I don't have that kind of money to spend. But I didn't build the quote with that in my head. I built the quote with what is going to be useful for them. And when you're starting a business, that that is, in my opinion, one of the hardest things to overcome is to not think about things with your money because that's generally how you start. You're like, oh, I'm good at this. I could I could do it cheaper than the other guy and I could make money at it. And then you get into it and you're like, well, the other guy was actually not a bad price. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that was a big thing that I had a problem with. We used to mount TVs, and the only people that we mount TVs for now are existing clients, right? Like if we're in a business and they need TVs hung in their office, fine. We don't do residential work. And a lot of that reason is because you look at Amazon services now. You can buy a TV from Amazon and like, yeah, somebody install for $50. Mm -hmm. Like I can't pull the truck out of my driveway for 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. Like I, I can't. You just hope that TV and stays that's, on again, the wall because, for 50 bucks, right? Yep, that's <laughs> it. And, and somebody's honestly there. They're not running wires through the walls. They're maybe hitting a stud if they're lucky. Like, no offense to a lot of those TV installers who are doing that work. Like, good for you guys. We're, we hope you're out there doing it and making a good living. But, but like, I can't build my business around that because that just doesn't make sense. And the quality of work that you're going to get for 50 bucks over what we charge for TV is night and day difference. I was one of those like, guys, by the way, Ray. Doing that. <laughs> so was I, though. I mean, at the end, I, honest to God, when I started... When I went out on my own, I was that guy standing in Best Buy watching people buy TVs and handing them my business card and be like, I know what Best Buy is going to charge you. I know the kind of work that they do. I'll do it for you today. Right now, I'll follow you home and I'll install it for you. And I, I hung a lot of TVs that way. It, it, business changed, right? Yeah. We, we evolved. We grew. Um, and again, I don't want to take away from those people, but I do want to change the mentality of the race to the bottom. And I talk about it all the time and a lot of groups online and especially in our community is stop racing to the bottom. Like know your worth. Like if you're a hundred dollar an hour employee, you should be making a hundred dollars an hour. Don't sell yourself short and do three jobs to make that hundred bucks where you, right. you could have just done it in one, like know your worth, show your worth and build it. And that's important. Otherwise you're bringing our entire industry down. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's going to start disrupting these customers that think they can pay us bottom dollar. I mean, back in the day, Field Nation and all these different job posting sites, you could make great money on it, and now you can make $20 for doing a two-hour job now. It's it's ridiculous. And sometimes materials aren't even included in that cost. You have to pay for your own materials. It, it's, it's insane. And uh, I really wish that we could see that change, but... The problem is you're always going to have that Joe somebody out there that's going to go and undercut us. And at the end of the day, us as business owners need to realize that that customer is not the customer for us yep. at the end of the day. Yep. Uh, yep. I, I, I've learned that the hard way. Um, I had a customer years ago that we had to let go because just, just wanted to cut every single corner. And it's just it's hilarious because I just drove past her place the other day and uh, – she got kicked out of her massive office that 
we would have had to spend tons of time on and tons of work on because she took that uh, rent moratorium and said, sure, I'm not going to pay rent for the next year and a half. And, yeah, and now, she, now she's out of there. It, she just wanted to cut every corner that she could. And long term, I'm much happier. And I'm not getting phone calls at 10 o'clock at night because that's the only time that she can worry about her IT is at 10 o'clock at night. And I'm much happier <laughs> at the end of the day with it. Yeah, and I I just had a I have a customer of mine who ser- sells. Uh, I posted it up in the community. They they sell Ergotron mounts to hospitals. Yeah. So they ha- my client called me and they're like, Hey, do you know anybody out in the Midwest that can can hang a bunch of these for us because we're tired of using Field Nation? And I'm like, Yeah, absolutely. This is a no brainer. I know exactly who to give that to. Yep. It's some people are starting to see there is value in paying people the right wages as opposed to hiring somebody for 15, 20 bucks an hour off a of field nation. Right. It, so, it, especially when you're buying that expensive of amount too. Yeah. An Ergotron mount. Can yeah. you imagine spending a few hundred dollars on an Ergotron mount and somebody just sticking it in with a drywall anchor right? and it falling out and destroying the equipment that's on it? You 100%. Can't do those kind of yep. So we are slightly over the hour mark. I don't want to cut anybody off. I know we could talk for, for days, but I also don't want to bore the people that are listening to us. Uh, Mason and Marco, is there anything you guys want to touch on in regards to uh, any more talks about security? I mean, don't all jump at once, guys. I mean, I think I think that all this AI stuff is really going to take off. You know, just seeing what I've been seeing from the manufacturers that we install, um, whether it's you know detection of a, a, a simple as a pen movement or you know, an item or a color of an item or, you know, uh, whatever it may be. I think it's just, it's very interesting to see the analytics that go into this market and it's going to really, I think, make for more awareness to everybody. You know, I mean, you can see it even with some of the, the real crummy quality NYPD cameras. They're not good stuff, you know, they, but they do what they need to do because of the technology behind it. So I think as it gets better and everyone becomes more aware, um, they're going to really think before they act a lot of these things. And I think that even the audio detection of it, right? Like Ava has more audio detection as opposed to audio listening because now it can do uh, a gunshot detection, a horn, you know, different audibles it can pick up from that ambient noise and that environmental detection. So... That being said, it can then maybe trigger other events, right? Oh, we heard a gunshot. All right, lockdown, right? It'll activate to another, to the access control system. These things, they're here. They're going to happen. And I think once that does happen, it's going to make people much more aware. And they're going to say, well, we need that because of X. So why doesn't happen? And and that, truth be told, is why they need an enterprise CC or a bid inc, quite frankly. Again, we keep talking about knowledgeable integrators. It's different than putting a camera on a wall or even putting an access control on a door. You need to hire that company that knows how to make those cameras work with those doors, right? And I I think, to me, there's more value in that and just lowest bid, get a guy to hang cameras. Right, Mason? I mean, do you agree there? Yeah. That's your business. I I would also hearken it a little bit to there's not a lot of – guys out there like an enterprise like a bid inc like a twg or i forget if it's twg security but there's there's a handful of guys that are really knowledgeable in this industry and then there's a ton of people that know a little bit about a lot and i think it also comes down to you put someone in in a place that you say okay you're head of security and they because they don't live it they think that they know enough about it and they try to move and push the company in the direction that they feel is best suited, and you just end up making poor decision on top of poor decision on top of poor decision. And um, I, I personally think if you're a business owner and you do security and you're not focused on recurring revenue and AI, that y- you are you are not heading in the right direction. If you are installing WiseNet Wave, NX Witness, DW Watchdog. And you're like whatever motion detection till I die in line cross, you are, you are get you're gonna die a slow death of like the same way the coax did. Um, it's it 
for example, Josh uh, Leviton, um, he has been showing me a really cool system where you can say, hey, I got this un uh, this unknown object. I would like you to classify this object. He's having things classified like raccoons, deer in his backyard. And then he can have alerts set up that, oh, hey, a deer went in my backyard and it sends him an alert. Well, a deer's in the backyard or that raccoon. And when you can narrow it down that far, it's it's kind of scary, but it's also cool at the same time. I did a, uh, a video demo with, I think it's uh, Camelot or Camelot. And they were showing how you can just type in with clear text, a uh, person with red shirt, um, I forget the, uh, tailgating. They they just type that in, and the system takes that compound question, and it's able to display someone in a red shirt tailgating. And that just it boggles, it, it's so crazy, because so many people don't think that that's possible. It's always like, okay, you have to put this, this filter in and stack this filter on it and stack this filter. And it's very like the milestone type of system, so to speak, where it's like, we're adding these filters and then we get the result. And AI is just going to be where you just type in what you want. And for the most part, it's just going to work and it's going to pop out the result. And whether or not that company can adjust the shutter speed on their camera or whatever, it doesn't really matter. It matters what the end user experiences uh, because people, they don't care if you have a laundry list of stuff you can do is if you can actually execute on that. That's what people care about. Um, and I just, I, it's like Android versus iPhone. I think so many people, they go down the Android route and it's really, you see a lot of people go the iPhone route because it's like, well, I don't care about all this shit that doesn't work. I just want my damn phone to work like a phone. And, uh, yeah, I, I, that's my two cents. I could go on for for hours on this topic. Well, people want to get data I, fast, I, right? You know, that's they want yeah. these systems are going to be the Google of video surveillance search. I mean, Eagle Eye's doing it too. It's supposed to be out in the beginning of July. I said, "Can I have it now?" Because people want access to this stuff easily and now. They don't want to wait. Someone hit my car. Well, what will color is your car? White. Okay, white Honda. They want that information. They don't want you to have to sit there and look for this. You know, as good as these motion settings and whatnot are, no one wants to sit there and look for it. They want it right away. And you know, these these companies are just, I, I it's here. You know, I mean, even Alarm.com is doing really really cool stuff, and they've been doing it for probably the better part of two years already with this kind of AI. So it's here, and it just is going to get better and better. Yeah, yeah, okay. no, I, I can't agree more. And, I mean, we're at the almost one, uh, one hour, 20-minute mark, and I'd say at, at this point <sighs> that we can just keep going and going. But what I can tell everybody that's listening to this podcast, if you want to further this discussion, uh, join our Slack community. That's where you're going to meet Mason. That's where you're going to meet Marco. That's where you're going to meet me and Ray and all the other great members of our community where we can have these in-depth conversations and have that collaboration and the other big thing in our community is you might not know the best solution for your customer, but you can partner up with one of the guys in our community and do that job together. There's tons of collaboration that's happening in our community to better all of our customers' uh, solutions that we're providing for them. And to uh, join our community, you can go to tkcommunity.org, and there's a link right on there on how to join our Slack community. So... I think that's everything for tonight, guys. Is there anything else we wanted to uh, hit on? No, I'm I'm definitely going to echo the collaboration. I mean, th this guy below me, and I hope he's below me when I finish uh, <laughs> editing this podcast. But you know, I, I I hand off a bunch of work to Marco because I I don't do security work, I don't do card access, I don't do cameras, and I don't want to, and I don't right. have to because I can partner with an enterprise CC to do those kind of things. And you know, it's those client of Cal God. <laughs> Those kind of collaborations that are possible because of the community we've got in place. So, absolutely, I, I think there's a lot of value to that. Yeah, and I wish Mason was closer because I would love to work with you too. <laughs> be great when you go out to Chicago. You know, you can say hi. <laughs> I don't know. Does Does anybody ever go to Chicago and not say hi to you, Mason? Yeah, you I don't know. Happen? Maybe it's that maybe it's that Marco guy. <laughs> Only for two and a half hours away. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, Mason, where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, LinkedIn, at Bit Inc. Uh, Instagram, Bit Inc. That's really just the two. 
LinkedIn okay. is where I like to post more. Um, I like to post on Instagram too. I just like LinkedIn a little bit more these days. So, fair enough. Mr. Marco, where can people find you? Uh, every form of social media at Enterprise CC. Brandon. You can find me at tsc.it on Instagram. You can find the Technology Instagram at tk or sorry, Technology WW. And Ray, where can people find out more about you and uh, everything over at Libertas? Uh, Libertas Ray. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. We will be back very, very soon. We don't have any vacations coming up, so we should be getting back onto our uh, regularly scheduled programming here. So thank you again, guys. Thank you, Mason, for joining us tonight, and we'll have to do this again soon. Have a good night, guys. We'll see you all. Mm Mm-hmm.